Okay, before I answer this first question that we have today, I, I wanna explain to you how this hit me personally when I was a teenager. A leader, some guest, came to our church, our youth group, and actually spoke, and they said, among other things, that if I hadn't spoken in tongues, that I was not saved, and that freaked me out. I mean, it, it just really, really got to me. I wasn't really well grounded in knowing the word very well. Um, I just had an authoritative person in the church declaring to me that my eternal salvation was proven or disproven by the idea of whether I had spoken in tongues or not. And I think that this is not only unbiblical, but it's horribly abusive to people. And, and I am talking to you, if you have said this, if you have echoed these words to others, if you've told them that they have to speak in tongues to be saved, I think you're abusing them spiritually and you have to repent. That's what I'm saying. I'm not so much angry as I just honestly think I see clearly how bad this is. So let me give you the biblical stuff that we have on this topic. Um, the case that people offer for why speaking in tongues is required to prove salvation is usually based on a few passages in the book of Acts. And that's pretty much it. But none of the passages they use are taken in context or used carefully. They're just going to be like drive-by Bible study, right? Where you just, you mention a passage and you move and you move very quickly on. That's my experience. So let's look at a couple of them. Uh, one of them is in Acts chapter 2, which shows that in the early church, the inauguration of the movement of the Holy Spirit within the body of Christ, it starts in Acts chapter 2. They're in the upper room. They're praying. You know, there's tongues of fire right, that are really representing the Holy Spirit coming upon the people there, and they all speak in tongues, all speak in tongues, right, absolutely, they do. Then in Acts chapter 10, we have a passage where the gospel is going out to the Gentiles, and uh, Cornelius and his family, they get saved, they trust in Christ, and then they speak in tongues as well. Then in Acts chapter 19, we have a passage where there's a group that hadn't even heard about the Holy Spirit, and Paul baptizes them, they get saved, they, uh, this is actually kind of a confusing, complicated passage, but consequently, they all are filled with the Holy Spirit, and they all speak in tongues. Three passages, they all speak in tongues. Now, immediately what I want you to notice is this is not the kind of proof that we want. The, the proof that I want in Scripture is a passage that says something along the lines of every Christian will speak in tongues, right? That's, that's what I want to see. I want to see, a, I just want to see that every Christian is going to speak in tongues. That's all I need. And I don't have that anywhere in the Bible. What I have are three examples where everyone at the moment, at the location, spoke in tongues. But these examples are not about salvation in that sense. So in Acts chapter 2, it's the inauguration of the new work of the Holy Spirit in the body of Christ. They all speak in tongues, right? Then there's a bunch of people that get saved between Acts 2 and 10, and we don't have them speaking in tongues. It doesn't happen every time. Then in Acts chapter 10, <clears throat> this passage actually sh is, is meant to show that this work of the Spirit that's happening among the Jews, this promise from the Father, is also going to be active among the Gentiles who believe, regardless of whether they become Jewish in their practices. They don't need the law. They don't need to be under the law to follow Jesus Christ. That is the point of Acts chapter 10. And so Acts 10 is a reduplication of Acts 2, showing that the work of the Spirit is active in the Gentiles. If you're confused by that, watch my video on the Hebrew Roots Movement where I deal with the whole book of Acts and the Jewish-Gentile distinctions in the book of Acts. I think it's very eye-opening to understand the book. Then in Acts 19, it's a group that hasn't heard of the Holy Spirit. So this is more about proving the work of the Spirit than it is proving the salvation of the people. That's the context, right? But what's missing is a statement in Scripture that says something along the lines of um, everyone who gets saved will speak in tongues, and if you don't, you're not saved. So... In the book of Acts, we have a bunch of examples. I could offer more examples of people getting saved and not speaking in tongues than someone else can offer of people getting saved and speaking in tongues. Okay, so if their whole point is examples, then their thing is refuted. But then there's more. There's more scripture I want to look at. And the first one will be Acts, uh, excuse me, 1 Corinthians 14, 5. And this is subtle, but it, but it is a strong point. I want you all to speak in tongues. That's Paul the Apostle. He's wishing that they would all speak in tongues. He's wishing that they would all prophesy. But that's literally, this doesn't mean all of you will prophesy. Because if that was the case, if every Christian spoke in tongues or if every Christian prophesied, then he wouldn't say, I wish you all would speak in tongues. Here it is in the NASB. I wish that you all spoke in tongues. New King James, I wish you all spoke with tongues. The point here is that not everybody's speaking in tongues. And Paul's just affirming the goodness of the gift itself. Right? And I believe in the gifts of the Spirit. I believe this is active today. 
in the body of Christ. I don't think that it's a necessity for every Christian, though. I think that is an abusive and harmful thing to say, and Scripture proves it wrong. So the next verse I'll go to, and this will be the final one before I go to your guys' questions from the live chat, which I know are already piling in, and we're going to gather 20 of them, and I'll, or 19 more, rather, and I'm going to try to answer as many as possible today. 1 Corinthians 12.30, Do all possess gifts of healing? Do all speak with tongues? Do all interpret? Now, you have one of two ways of interpreting this verse. You can either say every Christian has gifts of healing, speaks in tongues, and interprets tongues. Or you can say that Paul's point is that every Christian doesn't do this and everybody knows that. Even Corinth, which was a very active, spiritually gift, active church. Well, let's look and see how we can consistently interpret this. Which one is it going to be? An affirmation that everyone speaks in tongues? Or is it the opposite? An affirmation that not everyone does? Now, here in um, verse 27, to give us some context, Paul's writing to Corinth and says, Now, you are the body of Christ and individually members of it. So, he's obviously talking to, to Christians. Every person, whether they do or don't speak in tongues in this category, they're all Christians here. And God has appointed in the church first apostles, second prophets, third teachers, then miracles, then gifts of healings, help administrating, and various kinds of tongues. These are different things God put in the church. The question is going to be, does God give those gifts to everybody or just to some people, right? If, if, and Paul's argument is going to go like this. If everyone speaks in tongues, then you also have to say everyone's an apostle and everyone's a prophet and everyone's a teacher and everyone does miracles and everyone does healings. Blah, 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 you, know, you go on the list. Here's my proof. Verse 29. Are all apostles? And the answer here is no. All are not apostles. Paul in 1 Corinthians even, in 2 Corinthians as well, he talks about how he's an apostle and there are some who are in other passages of scripture called false apostles. They're fake apostles. So they're not, not everyone's an apostle. Paul's an apostle. He has the signs of an apostle. He has an appearance of Jesus Christ that validates him being an apostle. All are not apostles. This is the easiest question to ask and answer. Um, are all prophets? No. Consequently, just like all are not apostles, all are not prophets. Are all teachers? No, everybody's not a teacher. And I know that some Pentecostals, some, hey, my theology is Pentecostal too, by the way. So some Pentecostals are going to say all are apostles, prophets, teachers in some sense. And here I think you're deliberately distorting the text to fit your preconceived idea of how active you think the gifts are supposed to be in your fellowship. So are all apostles? No. Are all prophets? No. Are all teachers? No. Do all work miracles? No. And this is, this is a big thing to know for those who have been given a false expectation of miraculous work through the ministries of things like uh, Bill Johnson or Brian Simmons or those who are promoting, you know, the Bethel kind of everyone is working miracles. This is what we do. Everyone's a prophet. That's just the way it is. Do all possess gifts of healing? No, they don't. We don't expect everybody to heal. I don't just tell every Christian to go out into the hospitals and start praying for healing. I, I, I want to yield to the leading of the spirit there and not assume on God that all have gifts of healing. Do all speak in tongues? And there you go. No. So all don't speak of tongues, just like all don't do miracles, all are not teachers, all aren't prophets, all aren't apostles. And then he finally goes on to say, you know, but earnestly, earnestly desire the higher gifts and then gives us the greatest thing to seek, which is walking in love, which is not cliche. This is like the heart of, of us following Jesus in our lives. Hugely important. So bottom line, I'm going to go to your questions in two seconds here, but bottom line is this. There is no requirement for speaking in tongues clearly stated in scripture. The examples of those speaking in tongues when they were saved are shown to prove things other than just their salvation. They're shown to prove the work of the spirit amongst the Jews and the inauguration of a new age of, of um, the new covenant. Then there is the work moving to the Gentiles. Then there is the same thing being confirmed to a group that hasn't even heard about the Holy Spirit yet, right? So this is about the theology of, of the work of the spirit. It's not about proving salvation. And... Then we also have, finally, clear, show me your salvation passages in the New Testament. First John, right, the book of James, the things that show your salvation, it's not tongues. It's going to be a life of consistent Christian obedience to Christ, an attitude of love towards God and love towards your fellow man. These things show your faith. These things reveal, you know, the outward evidence to other people that you are a Christian. So there are show me your salvation passages, and the answer is never tongues. It's always going to be the character transformation that comes through the work of God and faith consistently lived out. And those are two different things. And that's a whole Bible study <laughs> in and of itself. Um, I'll just add, finally, Jesus never spoke in tongues. Jesus never spoke in tongues. 
Think about that for a second. You would go to Jesus and you say, Jesus, you're not saved because you've never spoken in tongues. No. Wrong. Uh, I think that what's happening here is we have these like pious things we feel really good about. We feel like we can't tell the difference between biblical, just authentic Christianity and the traditions we've received from others. And if you think I have no tradition, all I have is Bible. None of us are apart from our, our you know, all concept of tradition. So the best thing to do is try to equip our hearts with the ability, our minds, with the ability to discern that some of the things that I've been taught may not be consistent with scripture, right? I have a robust, basic Christian faith, but I may have some remnants of other unbiblical or extra biblical teachings that I just don't want to read and force into the, the text. Be willing to change your mind. And we're going to go to your questions. And just so you guys know, I've already got 20 questions for today. I've got 20 already. So I, I'm so sorry I can't get to everybody. You can, you know, I know some people just keep putting them in the chat because you like log in and throw your question out there right away. And I understand that. But I am full up today. Um, so they're all from you guys. So here we go. Andrej Polak. Oh, and by the way, I'm Pastor Mike. And this is the uh, 20 questions with Pastor Mike. It's a Friday Q&A that I do at 1 p.m. Pacific time every Friday. And I just want to answer your questions. Um, it has been feedback from you that told me that this is a, a big value to you, that this has been official and helpful to you. And I listened to that feedback and now I'm doing more of that. So <clears throat> here we go. Andrej Polak says, <clears throat> does scripture authorize only one cup during the Lord's Supper? How should we face different government regulations of Eucharist, um, forbidden one cup drinking. Okay. That <clears throat> that's two questions. Um, does the scripture authorize only one cup during the Lord's supper? Um, I, I think we have to understand the difference between descriptive and prescriptive things in the Bible. And so in the last supper, there is a cup and in the, <clears throat> and in the Passover meal, there, there seems to be like one particular cup that's being brought up. Now, I'm not sure if that meant there was only one cup that they were all using at the end of the meal. That seems unlikely to me. I'm not, that's possible, but it seems unlikely. But also in the Passover meal, in the Jewish Passover meal, they have like the first cup, the final cup. There's actually cups, but I, I think that this is a cup that's shared. A lot. There's multiple people and they're drinking the first cup of the meal, the last cup of the meal. And so um, that's like the first dish of the meal, right? Like if you have a five course meal, the first dish doesn't involve one dish for the whole table. It, it's it's a dish as in a, a, a kind of food that's put on a plate and everybody gets their own plate. So <clears throat> my impression is that there may be more than one cup, but e e let's suppose that there's only one physical cup at the table. Strange as that might seem to me, but maybe I'm wrong. Maybe there's a Jewish tradition that I'm not familiar with. Um, so let's say there's only one cup at the table. <clears throat> the next question I have to ask is, does that mean that because descriptively at this meal, there was only one cup, is it a prescriptive thing, a requirement that every Christian who celebrates communion thereafter must have only one cup? And I think for that, there's just, there's just no scriptural foundation for that, right? The, the, the phrases like the cup that we bless and things like that, it refers to a single cup, but um, you know, even going from one congregation to another congregation, you got multiple cups going on at a time. And there's, there's no problem with that. Even if there's only one cup in a building at a time. And yeah, I think we're not seeing the forest through the trees here. I think that we're a little fuzzy. There's no clear teaching in scripture that there's only one cup per communion service, physical cup. Although there was only one cup conceptually, which I think we would all agree with the cup the only cup conceptually is that which relates to the blood of Jesus Christ and our partaking of it is our belief in his death and his resurrection. So I, I hope that that helps. Um, this is again an example, I think, of tradition being forced upon scripture, right? If, if tradition saying there's only one cup in the building and yet you read the scripture and it's like, well, it's not really clearly teaching that even if there was only one cup, which I doubt. There's my thoughts. I hope they're helpful for you. S.M. Hart. Please share your thoughts on the book of First Enoch. Um, First Enoch, here are some random, unorganized thoughts I have on the book of First Enoch for you to consider. I'm not, I haven't done all my homework on the topic. I've done some, but not all of it. Um, the book First Enoch appears to be quoted, at least a portion of it, in the New Testament. This causes some people to think that perhaps it is, in fact, scripture. 
A response to that is to say, hey, just because it's quoted doesn't mean it's scripture, except a response to that is to say, yes, but what's being quoted is the idea in Jude that Enoch actually did say the thing that is recorded in the book of Enoch, which would imply that it's an accurate account of Enoch. You can debate whether or not Jude is just saying, you know that book you're familiar with where Enoch said this thing, um, but it wasn't really Enoch. That's one option. I don't know that I would lean that way. Another option is to say, well, there can be an accurate thing in a book about Enoch without the whole book being accurate. And I would actually lean that way. And the reason for this is partially because in the book of Enoch, you have various documents written in very different times. It's not one book written by one author or one community at one time. It's like various editions where there was more and more added and added and added. And so if you take the quote from Jude and you say, oh, I'm going to, I'm going to say that whether maybe you don't say it's scripture, maybe you just say it's accurate, right? This section's accurate. Why would I think that a different author at a later time adding more content is also accurate? Okay. It, then all of a sudden Jude gets very hard to justify the book of Enoch. This is my understanding of the topic. Um, in addition to that, the, the Jews of the time did not consider Enoch to be scripture. Um, this is not like, uh, the general understanding of the book of first Enoch. It was not considered to be Bible, um, part of the old Testament, part of the, the revealed word of God by the Jews of the time. It's an intertestamental book. Um, so yes, th that would be, I guess that's my short version. I think Jesus also, he affirmed the prophets, the writings and, um, and the law, and he affirmed that they were from God, right? He affirmed that the Old Testament was from God, but the terms that Jesus is, Jesus uses to describe the Old Testament are technical terms. And those technical terms include the books that we have, Genesis through Malachi. They do, and this is important, they do not include the book of Enoch, just like they don't include the Catholic Deuterocanonical, they'll call it, or the Apocrypha, you know, those extra books that are in the Catholic Old Testament. The, the the terms Jesus used include just our Old Testament. The Jewish Old Testament is the same as the Protestant Old Testament today. And Jesus affirmed that. This was a great opportunity for Jesus to say something like, also 1st and 2nd Maccabees, or also Enoch, but he never did. And so I affirm the same Old Testament Jesus did, and I'm happy with that. Um, Lindsay Pinkard has a question. A friend just told me he doesn't believe the Bible is historically accurate the exodus and flood any advice on resources to help him the um this is a huge and expansive area to study lindsay so within the discussion of the flood we have the the easy the easier case you can make for the flood the more simple case which is to say that there are these there's this these multiple flood traditions uh historically speaking the, these different cultures around the world that are you can show they're disconnected they have their own understanding that there was a giant flood that wiped out mankind in the past and this isn't just the result of missionaries and so um i think inspiring philosophy on his youtube channel has some content on this that's available since we're on youtube and i like to direct you to the content you're already consuming so yeah, he has some content on the flood. You might check that out, Inspiring Philosophy. And he talks about flood traditions around the world. Uh, an, a, another debate, a longer debate, is the questions about whether the flood is global or, um, it, you, and the terms get confusing here, but I'll just say, or, or, if, or if it covered all of humanity, right? Did it cover the physical earth or did it cover the world of man? And that is another, and, and actually an active debate. I used to think this was no debate. I was like, you think it wasn't global? You're you're obviously not reading the Bible. And then I read the Bible more carefully. And then I thought, huh, I'm and for purely exegetical reasons. Okay. This is not about science and, and archeology. span This is just exegetical reason. The term earth in the Bible just doesn't generally mean globe, right? It doesn't, it doesn't mean flat earth either. It's like all of these discussions are irrelevant to the text of scripture for the most part, for most, most passages. So anyways, that turns into a whole nother debate. And so it, a historical flood in the memory of mankind across multiple various nations and peoples separated by time and culture and distance physically. That is a great way to talk about the flood. And I would start there. The book of Exodus and the Exodus of the Israelites going out of Egypt. There's tons of content out there about that nowadays. There wasn't 20 years ago. You would have had a hard time finding it. So this is new content and the people I would look I'd recommend, at least that I've heard talk about this. Let me just find the name real quick. Um, 
I will find it right now for you. Um, okay, there's a gentleman named Dr. Titus Kennedy. Dr. Titus Kennedy. That's right, just spelled them normal. And um, he has done content on the book of Exodus specifically. Uh, excuse me, not just the book, but the actual event of the Exodus. So a bunch of, he's done like his, his like, I think it was his doctoral research was just on this topic. And so recently he's come out and been sharing a lot more content. And I would highly recommend you check out his stuff. There's free podcasts you can find online. He was on a bunch of different Christian podcasts as well. And um, there's more stuff coming out in the future in the next couple of years on this topic, like books and videos that you will see. But check out Titus Kennedy. Yes, there is a lot of really interesting evidence for the Exodus. And one of the problems is that scholars in the past have adopted an assumption for various reasons. They've adopted the idea that the the Exodus happened much later than what the Bible seems to say. Then they, so the Bible's giving us like around a 1400 BC date. They would adopt a much later date, hundreds of years later. And they say, well, you know, in 1100, we don't have all the evidence of this Exodus and an invasion into Canaan, at, you know, at the time called Canaan, the land of Canaan. And yet the Bible gives a 1400 date approximately. And for that, there's a whole lot more evidence. So it's so interesting how those little assumptions can impact us. All right. Faded Princess says, please explain the parable about using your talents and how we can be sure what our gifts are. Let me just say this, Faded Princess, and, and maybe Sarah, you could help Sarah Zimmerman in the chat. I know I dealt with the parable of talents just a, maybe a month ago or so. Um, when you, if you can dig that up, Sarah, and put it in the, in the live chat for her, so that I don't just reproduce that same question here, but I will deal separately with the with this issue, um, and I'll summarize the, for the parable of the talents. I think it's just giving us the idea that whatever God has given you, you're investing it for His kingdom, right? I consider the, my my gifts, my time, and my uh, my physical wealth, right? Whatever finances I have, whatever talents I have, um, whatever abilities and whatever time I have, and I invest that for the kingdom of God. That's kind of the main point of the parable of the talents, that God wants a return on you. You're his, and he wants you to serve him. But how do I find what my gifts are? That's the second part of your question, and I don't think I've talked about that, at least certainly not recently. So here's my thoughts on this, guys. I'm not the guru of all Christianity, but I do think that God's given me a gift in answering people's questions and working through theological issues and, and doing apologetic stuff, and so... I'm exercising that gift. And that's how you find out what your gifts are. You just look at what you're good at. Um, you don't look at what's exciting. I mean, I hope it's exciting to you, but you don't do that. You look at what you're good at. One of the ways to, to see this in a, in a very practical sense, just gifts, just giftings, okay? When we say gifts, we often think miraculous gifts. Okay, that is a category of gift. You may have a miraculous gift, but if you just take away that concern for a minute and say, miraculous or not, my giftings are the things that I'm good at. And how do I know I'm good at it? It's often this. I do it, and it didn't even seem that hard. In fact, I'm surprised that other people can't do it that well too. That's kind of the way, on a very human level, you see your gifts. You're like, why is it that other people can't do this as easily as I can? I don't understand. Well, guess what? That's an area of gifting. That is an area of special skill. And I think to serve the Lord, and to be sensitive to the work of the Spirit in your life, part of that involves identifying the things you're good at, your gifts, whatever they are. It might be business. You might be really just good at business. It's easy for you. You like look at a business and you're like, I know where they, they're failing and I know how to make them work right. Maybe you should be doing business for the Lord. You know, right? Maybe just you get a big business and you have extra money to support missions and ministries. Maybe, you, you know, you use this for the Lord. You're, you're investing that for God. But another... Um, Another thing to, to think about then is what are you good at and then how can you use that for God? So for me, in ministry, I just did everything. When I first started serving in ministry, I did everything. I mean, I, I was the janitor at my church. I've been a janitor twice at two different churches. I've cleaned lots of toilets. I worked as a barista in a Christian coffee shop, making sandwiches and, and, and coffee drinks and booking bands and then trying to get Bible study. I cared so much about getting the word. So we'd have these Bible studies and these concerts. And slowly I started being asked to teach at those things. And then what you find out is you're doing everything you can for God. And you find that some of the stuff you're better at and some of the stuff you're worse at, right? It's harder and it nets less benefit versus the stuff you're better at. It's easier and it nets more benefit. If I do this, I don't accomplish much. Whereas if someone else does it, they get more done. But if I do this, I accomplish more than that person. That's my gift. It's very practical. 
So you discover your gifts by just doing everything. And then when you look at everything you've done, you go, that was what I was good at. Not that was what I liked. I don't care what you like. <laughs> that was what I was good at. That was what I was good. Not, not what was romantic to me, what was exciting to me. That was what I was good at. Why do I focus on that? Because I assume that if the Holy Spirit has gifted you in an area to be good at something, there's a reason why you're, you in the body will fit with the other body parts for the function of your gifts to bless and edify others. So by focusing on your gifting and not what you want or what you desire or what seems romantic to you, you find your the way you can bless others the most. Uh, there you go, faded princess. I hope that helps. Uh, Peter Williams de la, de la Guerra Garcia says, what are your thoughts on the Lutheran church? Is the liturgy slash tradition a hindrance to the gospel and true repentance or is there any value in it? Thanks, Pastor Mike and God bless. Um, I don't have that many thoughts on the Lutheran church because I just haven't looked into the Lutheran church that much. What little I know is that the Lutheran church, at least for many years, is going through like an internal struggle um, where you have the, those who are trying to hold fast more to biblical teaching and those who want to water down like towards kind of progressive Christianity where you basically have the outward husk of religion but you've lost the the fundamental wonder and truth of Christianity. You still focus on love and you say things about embracing people and acceptance and things like that but a lot of this is just like virtue signaling in the midst of like a decrepit theology. <laughs> That's going on in the Lutheran church from my, my understanding. But there are Lutheran churches and Lutheran ministers who are very much trying to toe the line and, and stay faithful to scripture. But when it comes to some of the other specifics about tradition and liturgy and stuff like that, I don't really have a lot to, to say about that, Peter. Um, I'm not sure. I haven't looked into it enough to speak thoughtfully about it and better not to speak about it if I don't know. Um, I am open to liturgy. I'm not opposed to liturgy. In fact, I used to be, right? Because I'm Calvary Chapel. So like you, 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 you raised Calvary Chapel. This, you may not know this if you're not Calvary Chapel, but you have this idea that church is done better in a warehouse than it is in a building with stained glass. In fact, <laughs> you start to get the impression this is not biblical and this is not what Calvary Chapel teaches. It's just something that happens. Groups just kind of develop their own traditions sometimes, right? Within, without anybody doing it on purpose. And this tradition that kind of came up with this vibe, this mentality, this attitude that like, Stained glass windows are a sign that something's wrong spiritually in your group. And, um, and I've come full circle on that. I'm like, why did I think that pews were stale, you know, represent stale ministry, whereas like, you know, fold out chairs in a warehouse represents lively ministry. God is at work here. And I think that the vibe was this, is that many of the older churches were just sliding downhill slowly and they just happened to have these older buildings with older things in them, right? Older way of doing stuff. And then when when God just started a work and a bunch of people got saved and they were like, let's find a church, they just rented a warehouse or they used a storefront. So they started identifying the storefront and the warehouse with the work of the Spirit. That was That's a mistake at any rate. That's the way that we can sometimes respond. And and because of this, I actually think liturgies. look, if, if you want to have like this sort of real structured routine and your regular services, it's weird to those who haven't experienced it, but it's also comfort to those who are familiar with it. And so there's a pros, pros and cons. Um, I'm not opposed to it. The question to me is underneath the liturgy, what is the theology and what is the things we're believing and teaching and holding to? Um, and that is where my discussion focuses. Uh, Noah Bramble says, how do you understand 1 Thessalonians 5.23? Let me, let me get to that verse. Here's what we're going to do. We're going to read it. I think this will probably be good. We'll read it together and then I'll ask the rest of your question so we can all be on the same page. Now may the God of peace himself sanctify you completely and make your whole spirit and soul and body be kept blameless at the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. All right, here we go. How do you understand 1 Thessalonians 5.23? Is Paul saying every person has a distinct spirit, soul, and body, or just that everyone has a material and immaterial nature? And how are spirit and soul different? All right. <laughs> I do not know how to answer this question. How are spirit and soul different? Um, I don't know. And I have given it some thought. 
And I know there's an answer, okay? I just don't know it. I just don't know it. Um, so let's take your question in pieces. And I probably the most interesting part I'm not going to be able to answer well. So is Paul saying that every person has a distinct spirit, soul, and body? I, I think so. Yes, spirit, soul, and body. Um, he's, he's, he's mentioning all of these. And they, th there's some distinction between them. Doesn't mean there can't be any overlap in some sense, but there's some distinction between them, right? Spirit, soul, and body are individually possessed. We, we, we each have these. Um, now, how are, <clears throat> how are spirit and soul different? Now, in some cases in the Bible, spirit and soul seem to be used interchangeably. And this may be because there is some overlap between the function and the, you know, of the spirit and the soul. At some point, they're doing the same things, maybe. Now, I would think of a spirit as being like this, this, this immaterial, my default is my spirit is my immaterial, eternal person, right? That, this, that's my spirit. I obviously use a body, need a body and all that. Maybe the soul is that thing that creates the bridge between the spirit and the body. And so the soul is, is, is somehow functioning as, as the, the thing that connects the spirit and the body. Or maybe the soul is the intellect. Um, where in some cases it seems to be the intellect. In some places in the Bible, the soul seems to be referencing like the emotional um, sensations of mankind. Um, you know, David says in the Psalms, like, oh, my soul, why are you cast down? And the soul can be cast down and the soul can be grieved. And so maybe it has to do with that emotional center. That's a possibility. But I, I think there's other things to consider and I don't know the right answer. So I'm moving on. <laughs> Noah Bravel says, how do you understand? Oh, that was Noah. Uh, Lavelle Martinez, she asked a question. People often use Proverbs 18.21 to say our words have power and use it to speak things into existence. Is that the true meaning of the verse? Are there any verses that support your point? <clears throat> um, Proverbs 18.21. I love Proverbs and I think it's a massively underused book in the life resources of a Christian and the teaching resources as well of, of leaders, massively underused, but so often when it is used, it's misused. And so let's look at it. Death and life are in the power of the tongue and those who love it will eat its fruit. I did talk about this in some detail in a video, I think at this verse, in some detail in the video I did on new age beliefs and word faith teaching, some word faith teachers, not all of them. And uh, that was, that, it's actually been a popular video on the channel, you may have seen it, it it's, it's with Melissa Doherty. <clears throat> and I actually go through a bunch of verses like this. And so let's see if I can remember some of the points. Um, some of the points here. First thing I want to do when I have a verse like that is stop and read the context and ask, is there, are there surrounding verses that give greater context to give better meaning and understanding to verse 21? And I think verse 20 is probably, yeah, probably just the, uh, the, uh, the verse that you need to know. Verse 20 and 21 are actually a unit. They go together. They're both saying part of the same thing. So from the fruit of a man's mouth, his stomach is satisfied. He is satisfied by the yield of his lips. Death and life are in the power of the tongue, and those who love it will eat its fruits. So clearly they're connected because they're like eating the fruit of the mouth. I think what is being said here is simply this. The things I say out loud will change my life. That is the, um, let me give you an example. Uh, I, I had a friend who had a short temper <clears throat> and he would go off on people and he thought it wasn't a big deal. Like he was one of these guys who his temper flared up and he would rip on somebody and he would storm off and he would, and then later he would come back and he was totally over it. And he just assumed that everybody would get over it the same way. You know, people like this, maybe you're one of them. The, the idea is that you're, you're causing a lot of trauma to people, but you don't care because you just, you don't feel it yourself. So you figure it doesn't really exist. At any rate, this man, <clears throat> from the fruit of his mouth, he mouthed off to his boss, got in an argument with his boss, and then he just flipped out and was like, fine, I quit, and he walked away. About two weeks later, maybe a week later, he calls his boss up, and he's like, man, I'm sorry, I shouldn't have said that, I was just, I was just ir irritated, and I was about it. Now, he'd worked there for like 20 years, but he quit, and his boss told him, no, you're done, you quit, I'm, I'm, I'm sick of dealing with you, you do great work. He, he did great work. There was no problem there. But he's just sick of the guy because of his mouth, because of his jabbering, because of his contentious nature. And so he ended up losing his job and things went very downhill after that for his life, actually, sadly. His death and life were in the power of his tongue and he ate the fruit of it. Now, those who have a good tongue, who let their tongue be ruled by the work of God, by the spirit, 
who speak the not just uplifting things, not just positive things, although there's an element there, but who speak true things and things that are not tainted by the flesh and by carnality, they will receive the blessing of that. They will receive that blessing. Those who don't, they will get fired or they will have they will lose friendships, they will lose opportunities because of their mouth. And it's sad. There's a statistic I read a while ago that said that most people lose jobs not because of performance but because of attitude. And I think that that's what this kind of thing is talking about. You know, when you have friend, friends and you lose a friendship, it's, it's more often because of what they say than anything else. Our words, like James 3 says, our words start fires. And that's the thing it's talking about. It is not talking about speaking things into existence like the sort of new agey idea that I'm like, I, I declare um, this book will turn into a million dollar bill. Million dollar bill. I mean, this is just stupid right like but that's not what the passage is talking about it's talking about the practical impacts of our words and how they change our lives uh, like james 3 says and then i think i could apply this to the bible and to christianity in a way of saying when you confess the lord jesus right this is more death and life or in the power of your tongue in probably the greatest way you confess or you deny christ there is death and life in the power of your tongue and you'll eat its fruit powerful Let's look at uh, Ed Jacobson's question. What does it mean that God made the world through the sun in Hebrews 1, 1 through 2? Is using the word through different than using the word by? Appreciate you and your ministry, brother. Um, let's see. I'm going to take us to the passage. And I love this passage. Um, and thank you, Ed, for the encouragement, by the way. Okay, long ago, at many times, in many ways, God spoke to our fathers by the prophets. But in these last days, he's spoken to us by his son, whom he appointed the heir of all things, through whom also he created the world. And here, let's look at a couple translations. Maybe that'll help. Um, here in the NASB, it also says, through whom also he made the world. The New King James, it says, through whom also he made the world's. And I'm just going to do a few more. Uh, through whom he made the worlds. That's the, oh, that's also the NASB. Let me get you another one. NIV, which is small print, but I'll read it to you. Through whom he also made the universe. And then we also have um, uh, the NRSV, which is through whom he also created the worlds. And what's my whole point here is that it's very consistent. We get through whom, through whom, through whom. And... Um, he's spoken to us through his son, da, 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 and through the son he created the universe. That's the New Living Translation, which is less of a literal, but still uses the word through. The Holman Christian Standard Bible also says through him. So we're getting a lot of through him, through him, through him. Um, what's the point of this? Uh, well, before I answer your, your, your question about difference between through and by, let me just say this. The, the idea here is what some people call the economic trinity which is, I think, maybe not the best term because it confuses people who are not initiated <laughs> into the term. Um, there's a difference between what the Trinity is, who God is, and what God does. And just as there are three persons in one God, there are different functions that the different persons of the Godhead do. And so when you see the Father creating, it's the Son is the one through whom creation is made. Now, theologically, I think that there's something significant there because not only is creation through the Son, so is salvation through the Son. And so, so if I could draw this out for you physically on the screen, here, you know, God the Father creates through the Son, boom, there's creation. Creation falls, creation fails, and then he reconciles through the Son creation back to the Father and back to God. So I think that this is this is part of the symmetry of salvation, of creation and salvation through Christ, both of them, and that's really significant. Uh, God's acting acting in creation in Genesis one is like God's acting in John one in the beginning, where the Word was with God, and then all things were made through Him, and then He came to be our salvation. I think this is profound, um, really profound. Now, what's the difference between through and by? Through and by. Um, that's a good question. I'm not entirely sure how to how to how to give you that. Um, I guess if you said by, you might create more distance between what the father was doing through the son. 
the father's more active with the word through than with just the word by, right? Anyway, I'm just throwing that out there. I, I, I don't know if I've answered that last question very well, but I, I think that the theology of it is profound and it's a neat scripture. Tia Jane says, how do I know the Holy Spirit? Are there any teachings about having a relationship with him that are not focusing on only on the gifts? Um, and I'm going to have to start moving pretty faster because I want to try to get to 20 questions and I'm only to nine, which is not a surprise. <laughs> Um, so I'm going to move pretty quick. Okay. How do I know the Holy Spirit? I'm not sure what you mean by that to you, but let's say that you, maybe you mean, how do I know that the thing that I'm thinking or, you know, thinking maybe I'm led to do something? How do I know that that's of the Holy Spirit? And it, it's hard here because how do I tell you what an internal awareness of the Holy Spirit is like? Um, what I can say is this, I can say that the thing the spirit is leading you to do will always be according to the word of God. It will be consistent with scripture because God will never contradict himself. And you know, he's spoken in scripture. That's how you know the Holy Spirit is, you know, he's spoken in scripture. The number one thing you know is that. And that if you think the spirit's leading you and it's disagreeing with scripture, God's leading me to leave my husband and marry this other guy. Nope, not the spirit. That's easy, man. This is, you know, so there's, there's the one check, the scripture check. Is it consistent with the Bible? Um, another thing would be to check your track record. Are you consistent in your impression that the Holy Spirit is leading you? Or perhaps you're in, getting impressions from your own desires and thinking that's the Spirit. Well, your track record of life should give you evidence if you're good at this or not. <laughs> that, that should be a clue. Second thing is don't think you have to have the leading of the Spirit every day, every hour or every once a week even. You, you have the direction of, of the Spirit going on in the Word of God. You have it in your awareness of right and wrong. There's the Spirit leading you. But... Be open to the leading of the Holy Spirit. You also said, are there any teachings about having a relationship with him which are not focusing only on the gifts? Thank you. Yes, actually, in my Romans series, I talk about, um, in Romans 8, I have a lot of videos in Romans 8, but one of them is about religion versus relationship. And I talk all about that. And I deal in Romans 8 with the whole idea of the Spirit crying out, Abba, Father, which has nothing to do with the gifts of the Spirit, right? It's nothing to do with supernatural gifts. It's all about that relational thing. That would probably benefit you, Tia, if you can find that, that teaching in my Romans series online, which you can find here or on BibleThinker.org, and um, look for the thumbnail that that talks about relationship. Uh, Joel Holmberg has a question: Would it be appropriate for a Christian to attend a same-sex wedding of a family member or friend, or would that express acceptance of the union? I think, generally speaking, my general thought is that it's probably inappropriate um, because it's an affirmation. It, it's, it's not just a statement of love. And to pretend that this is just about saying I love and support you is is to not pay attention to reality. I mean, like, would I go to my friend's baptism? He's being baptized as a, as a Mormon. No, like, I, I can't. I love him too much to go and blindly encourage him in something that is ultimately a rebellion against God and, and, uh, and a sp spiritual disaster. And so I, I, I think generally speaking, no. And I think honestly that it probably doesn't earn you as much credibility as you'd like to think. Your friend, unless you're going to compromise Christianity and just say same-sex marriages are just fine. Um, unless you're going to say that, your friends are still going to look at you like that, right? Because this is, and this is like what I found. Uh, atheists online, the number one thing they like to hit me on and pound me on because I get videos a lot actually about me. <laughs> and uh, it, it is the topic of homosexuality. And whether I went to a gay wedding or not wouldn't matter to them. Right. We, we, yeah. I, anyway, I think generally speaking, I would say don't do it. I can imagine there's some situation of life where it might be a right thing to do, but in general, probably a wrong thing. And I think that seems pretty clear. Uh, Taste Remains says, for several years, when thinking about the eternal life or afterlife, I've strongly, I felt strong anxiety. And I fear that these feelings might indicate I don't love God. Any thoughts and or tips on this? Yes, absolutely. First John. I may have typed in first joyon, which isn't really a word. Okay, here you go, buddy. I hope this helps. Beloved, let us love one another, for love is of God, and everyone who loves has been born of God and knows God. Anyone who does not love does not know God, because God is love. And in this love, God was made, in this, the love of God was made manifest among us, that God sent his only son into the world so that we might live through him. In this love, and this is love, not that we've loved God, but that he loved us. And he sent his son to be the propitiation for our sins. Beloved, if God so loved us, we also ought to love one another. No one's ever seen God. 
If we love one another, God abides in us and his love is perfected in us. By this we know that we abide in him and he's in us because he's given us of his spirit. And we have seen, notice it wasn't because you speak in tongues. <laughs> and we have seen and testify that the father has sent his son to be savior of the world. Whoever confesses that Jesus is the son of God, God abides in him and he in God. So we've come to know and to believe that the the love that God has for us, isn't this beautiful? Have you, have you come to this place? T- taste remains, this is my question is, Have you come to a place to know and believe the love that God has for you? It's one thing to just like be kind of like, I know the teaching about, but I know and believe the love that God has for me. Let's read on. God is love and whoever abides in love abides in God and God abides in him. By this is love, by this is love perfected with us so that we may have confidence for the day of judgment because as he is, so also are we in this world. Now we take that love that God has for me and I apply it to judgment, which is your question. By this is love perfected with us so that we may have confidence for the day of judgment. My awareness of God's incredible love for me and that I'm in Christ and that he loves me incredibly, that awareness is why I have confidence in the day of judgment. Your confidence about God's love, that's the thing. Because as he is, so are we in this world. There is no fear in love. And this is about fear of judgment. This is the question you have, you know, when you think about the afterlife. There is no fear in love, but perfect love casts out fear. And this isn't your perfect love. It's his perfect love. When you look and you see, God so loved the world, he gave his own son. And that really applies to me. And that this this Jesus on the cross is a testimony to God's deep and abiding love for me. And I have trusted in Christ and I rely on Christ and I look and I know and believe the love that God has for me. So I am not afraid to die because my, his perfect love casts out my fear for fear has to do with punishment, right? That's what I'm afraid of. I'm afraid of afterlife punishment, but whoever fears has not been perfected in love, right? Perfected in his love. Right? We love because he first loved us. I got to start with his love for me. That is where you need to begin. When you think about the afterlife, I want you to think about the God who loves you so much. He sent his own son to die on the cross for your sins. When you think about the fear of death, I want you to think about the, the God who sent his son to die and rise again that you might know eternal life. You need to see the love of God in the, in the, in, in the cross. If anyone says, I love God and hates his brother, he's a liar. And of course, this translates, do I reciprocate this love that God has for me towards others? That's huge. He who does not love his brother, um, whom, he is, cannot, whom he has seen, cannot love God whom he has not seen. Anyway, so we, we get the idea here is that the, the way to deal with anxiety about the afterlife for a Christian is to recognize who we have in Christ. In fact, there's, there's another verse, I think, I'd like to share with you also in 1 John. Let me find this. This is also a very powerful passage. Um, First John 3, 19. Here you go. Whenever our hearts condemn us, God is greater than our heart and he knows everything. <laughs> God, I know you love me. I know I trust in Christ. I know I have the evidence of the work of your spirit in my life. Like I, I have valid reasons for thinking that I'm a genuine believer, even though I have struggles. But my heart still condemns me. I still feel like, but but maybe, but maybe I'll be judged. Maybe I'll just stay in and get judged. And here's the good news is God doesn't judge you based on your heart condemning you, right? Your heart condemns us. Yeah, well, God's greater than your heart and he knows everything. He knows the whole story. He, not just your fears of the dark, but he knows everything. Beloved, if our heart does not condemn us, we have confidence before God. That, that's what I want. I want confidence because my, your fear, your anxiety about the afterlife, it will cause you to have a hindered prayer life, to have hindered a joy and appreciation of the Lord. And so you want confidence. That's the fear is that it's going to hurt your prayer life, right? right? If we have confidence, whatever we ask, we receive from him. And um, if you don't have confidence, just know in that sense, God is greater than your heart and knows all things. All right, I probably even spent too much time on these questions, but we'll just go long if we have to. How's that sound? Um, where am I now? Daniel C. has an interesting question about apologetics. Do you think there is such a thing as a neutral or common ground in apologetics? Think about this for a minute. 
Is there such thing as a neutral or common ground in apologetics? Or are our presuppositions so important that they have to be addressed before any evidence may be examined, as precepts say? Um, I've given this a lot of thought, actually, Daniel, and I did a debate with a presuppositional apologetics that no one has ever seen. <laughs> I did it um, with Living Waters, the ministry. They invited me to come and invited a precept to come, and we had a friendly brotherly discussion and debate. And supposedly it's going to go live eventually, but I would, but COVID put the brakes on that. And so I don't know, a, a year from now, a month from now, I have no idea. At any rate, this is one of the issues I looked into. One of the presuppositional apologetics talking points and presup for those who don't know, I have video content on that. It's very complicated, but the basic idea is that you have to assume Christianity is true, not prove it's true. Um, you assume not only that it's true, this is a particular branch of precept I disagree with, that you not only assume Christianity is true, you assume that your opponent knows it's true and that they're already believing it to some extent. And these are things that I think are unwise and not biblical either. Um, so one of their talking points is they say, you know, when you when you tell the person, see, creation gives evidence for God, you're giving them you're giving them common ground that you don't actually have. And I'm not interested in this. I think this is a total distraction. I think, Daniel, my opinion is this. I don't need common ground. And the word ground there is being used very fishy, in a fishy way, fishily. Um, but what I do need is I need shared beliefs, like of some kind, right? There are things that they already believe, and I want to use that to draw them to the truth of Christianity. That's all I'm doing. I'm using what they already see, what they're already aware of, to draw them to the things that they don't know. This isn't even necessarily shared beliefs. That's probably the wrong term for it. This is just, um, yeah, I mean, it's not common ground in the sense of going deep down into worldview issues. We have common ground all the way down to the presuppositions, and that's not the case. I agree we don't have the same common ground in that sense. We just have shared information you you start with things people already know and believe in order to bring them to the things that they don't know and don't believe or else you're not having conversations you're just you're just assuming things um sorry if that was a little fuzzy but presuppositional apologetics is fuzzy the whole thing is fuzzy i think i think half the presuppers out there don't understand it um and i'm not trying to insult anybody it's just like explain it explain to me precept in one minute 60 seconds you tell me what it is and you probably won't be able to do it uh, Gwyn Gazette, the Gwyn Gazette says, how do you think biblically about RPG games, video games, such as Elder Scrolls? Most RPGs you can play as a warlock using fantasy magic. Does the content and nature of a game affect your game choice? Okay, I'm not going to speak about me personally here. I want to speak principally in general. Uh, I'm going to make personal choices about video games that is going to fall in line with this whole idea of convictions and conscience. What I don't want to do is, is place my conscience upon everyone else, but I want to try to talk for a second about the principles that we use in trying to evaluate these things. So all of us with our conscience can apply these same principles and it will land in different ways because we're individuals. Romans 14 gives us plenty of space for different convictions on how we apply this kind of stuff. But some of the things are that you're, you know, you're living for the glory of God, that you're not being overcome. Somebody's not going to be able to play an RPG because it just consumes too much of their time, regardless of what's on it. And that they're being overcome by an issue in a negative way. And so somebody will fall in that category. But what about things like, um, is it wrong to play video games in general? I, I don't see a principle that gives me video games just being inherently wrong. It would have to be the content of the video game or my use of the content, right? Like my experience playing it has, has somehow brought me to sin through overuse, through obsession or whatever. But the content of the video game, now we have to ask some other questions. I think sexual content is a big is a big no. It is a big hard red line no. Not a conviction issue. Christians should not be exposing themselves to sexual content. Humans should not be exposing themselves to sexual content outside of the wonderful blessed place of marriage where it's supposed to be and where you should be exposing yourself to sexual content in that context. But what about violence? Well, violence in scripture is talked about much more openly than sexual stuff and there is some and even, so get this even positive sexual experiences are euphemistically spoken about in scripture adam knew his wife right like hey guys this is behind closed doors it's not for public consumption it's for private enjoyment this is like a special thing we're aware of it we're not afraid to talk about it we just don't want to take what's holy and 
and turn it into a sideshow. And um, but violence is a little different. I mean, it's like JL takes a tent peg and hammers it into Cicero's head, and it goes down into the ground. And this is like real specific stuff, meaning that I don't think that we have to have as strict of a view of violence as we do on the sexual matters. But then there's other issues. In the game, is my character performing violent actions that are immoral? Okay, well now it's Im now it's not just violence; it's immoral violence. It's wrong violence. And and I'm you know maybe you're more comfortable with a game where you only your character is like the good guy and you're only doing good things. And many RPGs will give you the ability to follow the good path. Although there's an increasing thing where there is no good path. That also happens, and that's a problem too. Um, and so then that's a question you're going to have to ask and deal with. And the next thing to ask is this, uh, whether it's violence or even, you know, magical spells. Here's, here's, here's another question about, say, the magic stuff. Is the magic purely fantasy or is it related to witchcraft, actual wickedness and witchcraft and evil? Or is it like, say, for instance, um, you have a character that has, like, a psychic ability to, like, move objects around. Well, psychic ability to move objects around isn't magic. Like, this is... This is not magic at all, right? This is just like a, it's just action at a distance through mental, you know, work or effort. So this wouldn't be magic. But then what about a character and, you're, and he's casting a spell and there's pentagrams on the screen and all this kind of stuff? Okay, that's a much more questionable issue. And it is very questionable at that point. I think we have to really wonder like, wait, is this fantasy or am I beginning to access, I'm beginning to touch on something that God hates, like hates. And that's a very serious question we should ask. I do think, generally speaking, Christians fall into two categories. Those that are super strict on these issues and those who have almost no rules at all. And I'm very confident that the super strict people are not doing anything wrong. And I'm equally confident that the people who have basically no rules about their video games and about their video consumption, about the videos they'll watch online and the kinds of things that will entertain them, and they have almost no rules, I think those people... I'm very confident, are making sinful compromises, right? Because moderation and wisdom is never just saying, it's no big deal, but it's evaluating and considering those things. So in general, RPGs can be okay. But if we don't have some limits and rules and balances that we put in there, then we're, we're going to fall into sin. Um, only in Antarctica says, is there, a scient is there scientific evidence that the speaking in tongues is real? Um, I, don't, I don't actually know. That's a great question. I, I don't know. If there is or not, haven't looked into it. Um, I know there's experiential evidence. There's plenty of stories of that kind of thing. But I don't know. Um, in my own life experience, I've experienced, and it's not much, but I have experienced speaking in tongues that I felt was legitimate and real. It was not with interpretation, but it was with very much, very, very much the what seemed to me be, to be the work of the Holy Spirit helping me through very hard times. Uh, but that's just personal. Uh, Micah says, can you explain what Jesus meant when he said to sell your cloak and buy a sword in Luke twenty two thirty six? And I'll try to move kind of quickly. But this, to me, I think the best understanding of this passage is that he wanted to uh, protect the disciples from the oncoming dangerous moment in the Garden of Gethsemane when he was betrayed. But he didn't want them to actually start a, a battle. So, you know... Um, if you go out into a mob and you're armed, they tend to leave you alone, unless you're being obnoxious, you know, triggering or whatever. But but if you go out in your arm, people tend to leave you alone. Maybe not as much nowadays, but that's kind of what's going on here. So he says, let the one who has a, no, has a money bag take it and likewise a knapsack and let the one who has no sword sell his cloak and buy one. Okay, I think Jesus actually means it. I think he means you guys, you need to be armed. For I tell you that this scripture must be fulfilled in me. He was numbered with the transgressors transgressors for what is written about me has its fulfillment. So Jesus is like about to be betrayed in the garden and there's a, like literally a militia of people coming to take Jesus and they're they're willing to take him by force. They not only hate Jesus, they hate his followers. This is a powder keg moment. It could turn into the death of many people of the disciples of Jesus. So he says get a sword. But then consequently right after that, Peter uses the sword and Jesus stops him. Wait, I want, here's a sword, but I don't want you to use it? Okay, well, it's not meant to be a giant riddle. It's just this. Have the sword, be ready for self-defense, but do not use it to aggressively attack as I'm being taken away to go to the cross. So we're not to resist when martyrdom is happening. 
um, according to God's will in our lives, like it is with Jesus, don't resist. But when it comes to general self-defense, I think Christians can absolutely take up a sword and use it for only self-defense, not for just preemptive attacks, not because you're angry. Um, I think it's just self-defense. If you say that, you know, if someone breaks into my house, I'm going to make sure they die before they get out, but they're going to be dead. That's not self-defense, guys. That's premeditated murder. Um, self-defense is if they break into my house and I feel like my life or the life of my children or family are, are in danger, then you use self-defense, right? Because it's not about actually property as much as it, as it is about safety and life in this context. I think that would be a Christian perspective on those things. And more could be said about it, but the Christian pacifists, I think, do more harm than good. And they're not, it's not Christian to be a pacifist, in my view. Although Christians will be generally a lot less violent than not Christians if they're following Jesus. Um, Sweet Eats 2. This is question number 18 as we plow through and I have just committed to going over time. <laughs> uh, I'm confused about fasting. Should all Christians fast from time to time as a reminder that God is our true need? I've just never felt compelled to skip meals to grow closer to God. Um, should Christians fast from time to time? Um, let me put it a different way. Is fasting good? And if we ask it that way, instead of should I, if we just say, is it good? I think it's easier to answer the question. And the answer is, is fasting good? Yes, fasting is good. And here are some of the benefits of fasting because here's, here's what happens uh, in some circles and I've experienced this too. You think if I fast, I will, I will get to a spiritually mountaintop experience. That's not what fasting's for. Fasting's not primarily for giving you a spiritual mountaintop experience. Um, and you're probably disappointed when you fast if that's what you thought you were gonna get. You've probably done this. You fast and you're like, man, that was that was disappointing. I, I didn't get this giant mountaintop experience. I think fasting has other functions and it can give you this wonderful experience, but that's probably more about um, other things that are going on than just the fasting. Fasting is about denying your flesh and that is not fun. <laughs> and that's kind of the point. Fasting is not an enjoyable thing. Fasting is not something you're doing to lose weight. If, you do it to, if you're doing it to lose weight, you're not doing it as a spiritual exercise. You're doing it as a way to make yourself look more attractive. Don't call it spiritual fasting. <laughs> if you're fasting because you're trying to deny the flesh and you realize that every time you're craving food and you're saying no, that you're gaining mastery in your will over the flesh, that is one huge value of fasting. And for that, I would say fasting is very good. It's good because it reminds you that you need to say no to yourself all the time. To, to follow Jesus, to die to yourself. And that that's a positive thing with fasting. Fasting also presents us with two benefits of prayer. Uh, when I'm fasting, I am just more aware of, of the fact that I am in a spiritually focused time. And so I'm gonna be more likely to pray. I'll be more thoughtful, more spiritually minded about things because I'm just in that mode. Another benefit is in fasting is that meal times can be now devoted to prayer times. So 10 minutes here, 20 minutes there, an hour there. Maybe you were going to take 40 minutes to prepare your food and 15 minutes to eat it. And now you can take that time and you're like, I, I just prayed for like an hour. Or maybe you were just going to take a 15-minute lunch break, but you don't, you're not eating lunch that day. You're fasting. So for 15 minutes, you just pray for your coworkers and your family and your friends and your ministry and your church and, you know, and for for whatever, you know, and you're just, you're just lifting things up. So fasting creates not only a focus mentality on, on spiritual things, it creates opportunities for prayer that go beyond, um, you know, your normal routine. So there's a few benefits of fasting. Does scripture tell us when to fast? No, but it does seem to assume that this sort of thing is like present in the, in the life of a Christian. And so you're, I'm not saying you're in sin if you haven't fasted, but it's good. Like fasting's good. Don't, I don't think you have to fast for three days or you have to fast for 30 days. In fact, for the most part, you don't want to do that. Um, and, and you can fast for a meal. You can fast for a day. You can fast for days. And I've done all of the above and I found them beneficial. And I, I actually don't understand those who think fasting does nothing. I, I don't understand that. I don't know what they were expecting um, or how they were measuring what it does. I, I think it's very beneficial. So there you go. I hope that that's helpful for you. Garrett DeJong says, this is question number 19. We've got two more and we're done. Hi, Pastor Mike. I was wondering how the Pharaoh's magicians were able to duplicate changing their staves into snakes as Aaron did when accompanied by Moses in Exodus. Thank you. Now, this is interesting. 
Um, I've wondered the same thing. So Moses, you know, he goes to Pharaoh. He's like, let my people go. And then to show the power of God. And not just the power of God, but the power of God over the Egyptian gods. God does all these different things. So the staff turns into a snake or the Nile River turns red with blood. It turns blood to blood. And um, and in many of these cases, or at least a handful, at first they try to reproduce what Moses does. They turn their own staffs into snakes. Now, there's a cartoon version of... Um, the Exodus, where the way that they do this is they have their their staff, like maybe it's this long, and they kind of like slide their staff into their sleeve and then they throw and they go to throw their staff down. They actually throw a snake down instead. So it's pure sleight of hand. That's a possibility. It could be that. Um, but in the text of scripture, it doesn't really look quite like that to me. I mean, it's possible. It says something like by their, they use their arts or something like that to create, to do these things. And it's true that magicians of the past are known to use actual like magician tactics we have on stage nowadays, sleight of hand, misdirection, that kind of thing. But I'm very open to the idea that these magicians, Pharaoh's magicians, were actually using demonic power because we know that demons are behind idols and the worship of false gods. And we know that there are lying signs and wonders, the scripture talks about, that Satan's capable of. And so he's not capable of prophesying the future and he's not capable of actually controlling final world events, but he has got a lot of power and control in other areas. And so I'm not opposed to the idea that they actually just were using the limited power of Satan. And this is kind of evident because what they would do is they would do like a mock minimal version. You know, here, this is kind of interesting when you think about it. Moses turns the Nile River to blood. If you were Pharaoh and you wanted your Egyptian magicians to prove themselves, you would probably want them to turn the Nile River back into water. Prove that you guys have power. Instead, through their arts, they get some fresh water out of pots, I think it was, and they turn that into blood as well. Okay. Thanks for making things worse and proving that you're weaker than him because he did it to the whole river. I think that this is this is the um this is this is the evidence that they were doing something with lesser skill, lesser ability, lesser power, and that is evident in their response. And they're only able to reproduce things a couple times after that. They can no longer reproduce things. So yeah, it's possible they use sleight of hand. I, I'm inclined to think that it was actually just demonic power, but I'm open to both. And final question today, Connor Robinson says, how would you respond to a person who sees the church as a historically bloody and evil organization? Thank you, Mike. Connor, um, a few things I'll mention here. One is I would want them to know that I am not defending the entire history of those who claim the name of Christ. I am defending Christ. If they think that violence in church history is evidence against Christianity, then they ought to think the self-sacrifice of Jesus dying for the sins of the world is evidence for it. And we don't expect the church to always, the visible church, the way the church looks into the world to always represent Christ. In fact, look at Revelation chapter three, two and three, right? The letters to the churches, most of them are pretty disappointing, actually. Jesus himself is like, you're not really representing me right. That's kind of a big deal. Jesus himself taught about the tares amongst the wheat and how the gospel goes out and there's, there's wheat, that's the good, the children of the kingdom, but then there's tares mixed in with the children of the kingdom are, are worldly people that are not saved that look Christian. So Christian theology can answer this entirely well. We need to go to Jesus to show Christianity what it really is, what it's supposed to be, and then we can look at the book of Acts and the epistles to talk about what real Christianity is and the challenges that they face. We have predictions in scripture about the falling away, not of the entire church, but rather the mixture of tares amongst the wheat. So it's not like a great falling away, like say like a, the Jehovah's Witnesses would teach or something. We're not saying everybody fell away. We're just saying that there's a mixture of ungodly elements mixed in with the physical church on the earth. And that looks like that's exactly what happened. So I look at church history and I go, I don't have to defend that at all. I have no reason why I have to defend the Crusades. Now that being said, um, I'm under the impression the Crusades, many of them, are more defensible than people realize, but some of them are horrific. And if you're in a position where you feel like you have to defend the Crusades, you've got a you've got a difficult battle ahead for you. They did some weird things, like when they put children on the front lines. Yeah, children. Um, 
Anyway, there was some strange things that were done and some abuses and all kinds of stuff. So I don't defend the historical church. Okay, so, you know, 1,200 years after Jesus, a group of people saying they were Christians did some crazy bad thing. That doesn't prove Christianity wrong because Christianity never said that everyone who names the name of Christ would be godly. And I hope that that helps. It's a distraction. No need to defend it. Now, if you're Catholic, it's going to be a little more difficult. Um, but there's other issues there as well if you're Catholic. I got videos and I hope that you find them helpful. All right, you all, thank you so much for joining today. Went a little bit long, but I wanted to get to all 20 questions. Uh, That is the name of the show and I'm not actually maybe always going to get to 20, but today was the day for it. So hope it was a blessing to you and Monday, oh my goodness, I have delayed teaching this next teaching in the series of Mark. So Monday I'm teaching... um, the question of probably the strongest word of faith passage in the Bible. And I was like worried getting into it. I'm like, I don't want to misrepresent scripture because I'm trying to fight against word of faith stuff. Like I want to make sure I understand this accurately and correctly. And so I've spent a lot of time researching and reading and studying and um, a lot. Um, And I hope that you find the simple teaching that I'm going to bring Monday beneficial. We're going to deal with the question of, is Kenneth Copeland right (laughs) about faith? Is he right about praying in faith? And when they use Jesus' teaching that if you pray and you believe it, you'll receive it, right? That is the word of faith slogan. Is that really the whole story on prayer? And um, I think you're going to find it beneficial. So take care. And thank you to my moderators for being there. I will see you guys on Monday.